But we do know the following thing. As David said, life expectancy in general will go significantly up. We don't know how much exactly, how many years people will live, but we can safely assume that my unborn great-grandchildren will live to be at least 95. That's one thing we know for sure. The other thing we know for sure, and we learned it from Gila Oren and from, from Simon, is that 70 to 75 percent of the world population will reside in major urban centers within the, the next 30 years. We also learned from uh, one of our speakers today that forms of artificial intelligence, Thomas Sharon spoke about it, and um, forms of artificial intelligence will replace many of the jobs as we know them. So think about the world. Think about what, this, what impact this will have on the social contract. What is the social contract? There's a contract, unwritten contract, between us and our national government or between us and our city government. The contract says the following. I will provide you, I meaning the authority, the source of authority, will provide you with the conditions to live well, with health care, with education, with housing, with running water, with someone to pick up your garbage, with sewage, and so on. You, in return, will become a productive citizen. The emphasis is on the word productive. Pay your taxes, and this is how the system is going to work. And it worked perfectly fine until technology showed up. Technology showed up and increased life expectancy. And the question will become, what type of life are we going to have? When I was born, the average life expectancy of a man in Israel was 68 years old. Today, it's 81. This is just within my lifetime. The Israeli government did not count on that leap. As a result, we don't have the financial reserves to pay the pensions of these people. In the Israeli Defense Forces, we're now paying pensions for two and a half armies. Not one, not two, two and a half. Because people that retired from the army at the age of 45 and were expected to live only 20 more years are actually living 40 more years. So now you have to pay two and a half times the amount of money that you were planning on paying. And then ask yourself, OK, so people will live longer. And then they will be born into a world where there'll be no jobs waiting for them. Because there'll be no more drivers or even attorneys or medical doctors. It's going to be an algorithm that will scan your body at ER and will conclude very precisely what is exactly the problem with you. No mistakes, no need to guess, no need to touch here, no need to touch there. No more CPAs, no more attorneys. I know we have lots of attorneys here in the room. Think about that. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty, I know people think it's crazy, but that's exactly, and I have my friend here, Clayton, who's, a, who's an expert on this issue, can confirm this is where we're heading. And then people will congregate in big cities. So what's going to happen? So I'd like to actually present an optimistic view. Um, I know it sounds insane, right? But hey, that's, that's, my, that's my prediction. It's not based on any empirical study, just based on my understanding of how the system works. Because we spoke about the centrality of cities today, but we did not mention the fact that throughout history, cities existed for 10,000 years, and nation states only for six, 700 years, as we know them. So, I would like to urge you to, re to read more and be inspired by the centrality of knowledge and creation and co-creation in ancient history, from ancient Greece all the way to the Renaissance. And I believe, and this is my firm belief, and I, and I think there's a lot of evidence to support that, that ultimately this is going to be the solution. People will be born into a world that will be all about creation and creativity and co-creation. They'll have no other thing to do. And people will survive in that world based on their own talent and their own contribution. There's already a marketplace for that. It's called Fiverr. I don't know if you've heard of Fiverr. But Fiverr is a beautiful marketplace 
that actually allows people to take advantage of their own creativity and their own skill. So if what you're good at is cooking, go ahead, cook. If you're an expert in growing cucumbers, do that for a living. Be the cucumber person. And uh, by the way, I'm sure there's a great market for cucumbers and pickles. Yeah, and the chickens, you like the chicken, you like the, the story about the chicken. And so, how this is going to impact governments and diplomacy? Here you have a concluding slide. If classic diplomacy was based on the need to advocate, what we heard today tells us that you need a, not only a different skill set, you need a different approach altogether. You need to know how to tell a story. You need to know how to engage in research. You need to shift from a classic model of advocacy to a new model of proactive marketing. And this was Matthew was talking about, is marketing, the impact of marketing. And my friends, I believe that ultimately, this is not just the most important form of diplomacy, it will become, because of technology, the only relevant form of diplomacy. Because what it's, look at what's happening. The decision makers, the elected officials, basically confiscated the practice of diplomacy from the hands of the civil servants. It's not just happening in the United States. It's happening in Israel and all over the world. And they communicate directly with their constituents above the heads of the traditional media. The civil service is being viewed not only as an unreliable and incompetent element in the system, it's being viewed as an enemy by the elected official all over the world. It's the same problem. So diplomacy as a practice is facing its most dramatic crisis ever. And the solution is obviously to reinvent itself and the way to reinvent itself is to emphasize the need to know how to tell a story, to have the ability to connect people emotionally to whatever it is that you're trying to sell them, whatever it is that you're trying to share with them. And this is really the key. And I know we have several therapists here in the room, psychologists and psychiatrists. And, and this is really what we need. We need more anthropologists out there. We need more psychologists out there trying to understand the psychology of consumerism. And the last thing I would say, and I know Professor Nick Kahl just left, um, but I wanted to give credit to one of his colleagues, uh, Professor Henry Jenkins from USC, who coined the term participatory culture and, and explains how um, actually technology created a new type of media or information consumer called the new participant. And the new participant is all about uh, co-creation and, and, and co-production and creativity. The new participant takes himself or herself very, very seriously. Uh, they mentor one another and they create a whole culture of people that have access to media and content.